Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasant uh, afternoon to have all of you today. I am Bob Bailone, the president and CEO of the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. Um, pleased today to have with us uh, Cindy Andela, president and owner, developer extraordinaire of Andela Glass. And we'll be learning today um, some insights as to uh, her business, as well as glass processing and recycling, and uh, all those things glass uh, that that uh, you know is important to us. Um, we're going to treat this as an interview-based uh, program, as we have in the past, once per quarter. Um, so, if we can uh, have your videos muted, which it appears to be uh, the case, is what we want. Um, Cindy and I will go through the program uh, today and feel free to use your chat or question features. We'll be sure to bring forward topics as you may have, have points of interest that we'd like to address. So uh, one last uh, uh, housekeeping item. I do see on our, briefly on our attendee list today, we have Gordon Burgoyne with uh, Covant Covanta, uh, e-waste uh, solutions and Gordon is uh, happily one of our board directors so want to give a shout out to uh, Gordon Burgoyne today and Scott I'm picking you up on the on the video if you'd like to uh, come in as a panelist please so with that um, I'm going to move forward again today we have Cindy Andela with us Cindy good afternoon good afternoon Okay, great, great sound check there. And I'd just like to start off by, you know, having you tell us a bit of briefly about yourself as well as what brought you to your glass company and your interest in this area. And, um, you know, just again, just a little bit of a background. Sure, thanks, Bob. Um, a lot of people I do get asked quite a bit about how did you get into glass? You know, that's quite often a response I get. And it is interesting because um, I had to think back and it goes back to actually recycling programs. Back when I was in college, I have a degree in um, mechanical engineering and we worked on projects and that included a project um, in a recycling center and recycling glass was an issue back then. And so some of those ideas stuck with me as I went into uh, first a career at General Electric where I got my master's in business administration and some you know, industry expertise. Uh, then I kind of jumped off that corporate bandwagon and took the vow of poverty, as I say, and became an entrepreneur and started um, <laughs> my own business. And I've been in the glass recycling equipment business and now kind of all things glass for over 25 years. So it's actually been quite a while. Um, the whole idea was to turn glass back into sand. It was a very simple concept, kind of a concept before its time. But the idea was, why don't we take glass, turn it back into a sand product, that can be used in every community. It's a small green footprint, take a local waste, turn it into a local resource with local processing. So you don't have to ship it long ways. Um, that is a really great solution um, around and between the traditional solutions of turning glass back into bottles. I think one of the things we're gonna to talk today is about how important it is to do both. Um, and that's, you know, the uh, technical background of being an engineer and being in manufacturing all these years, I really enjoy designing equipment and systems, and that's what we do. And I also enjoy talking about glass, which is what brought us here today. Oh, Bob, you're muted. That sounds great, Cindy. I appreciate that brief intro. And, you know, I think a lot of our listeners uh, obviously are not glass or ceramic scientists, most of us come at this from recycling, but I do think some basic glass knowledge is important, especially before we would discuss any one of a number of secondary uses for glass uh, or alternate uses than a container. Um, you know, I think people over time, if you're around it long enough, hear about the fact that there's issues you know, at certain size ranges when you put glass in concrete, it causes problems. Or that glass is, you know, amorphous, you know, the term amorphous silica, and it, you know, it doesn't cause a silicosis breathing hazard, for instance. Some of these things, I think, 
are interesting to know and even from a lay person's view of it helpful to know perhaps a little bit deeper dive of some of those those terms and aspects of glass could, could you elaborate on that for us a little sure i'd be happy to do that uh, again that's one thing i had to boil down to a simple explanation so we can all understand it i i start out with a bit of chemistry glass is silicon dioxide sio2 and SiO2 is like H2O, is a very common molecule that makes up a big part of the earth. We all know what H2O is, it's water, and we're familiar with it. SiO2 is dirt. It's, it's the 60% of the dirt is SiO2. And when that's in the ground, as a sand, a clay, a coal, you know, any kind of dirt, it's um, called crystalline silica. When you take this crystalline silica and you put it through the fire, and it becomes lava, you know, molten, okay? Then it's in, it's um, similar to water. We have crystalline silica, similar to ice. When you heat it up to the point that it becomes lava, it's similar to steam. If we take the analogy of water. And when you quench it, it becomes amorphous silica. And it, like water, that is actually a liquid. Um, silicon dioxide has three phases, just like water does. And that silicon dioxide in its, amorphous form is um, a super cooled fluid. So those windows that we show behind us actually are, will flow over time. And many people have seen older windows that have um, changed shape and have flowed. And that's because glass is, a, is in that form. Um, because it's not back into its crystalline form, it actually has different chemistry too. It has a negative charge on the surface. It um, is, reactive because of that. And that's the key to some of the question, things that you mentioned, like what, how does it react in concrete and cement? And it all goes to the surface chemistry of the glass um, because if you have it a very, very small particle in a powder form, it's called a poslin, and it actually is a cement replacement and acts very positively in the concrete mix. It makes a stronger, denser concrete. If you have a bigger particle like a stone, okay, and you're trying to replace stone and concrete, you can run into problems because of its reactivity, it can cause some problems over time, but it is not a problem if it's a powder. So you really have to know about the chemistry to know how to safely use it in, in concrete. But it's also a very positive thing when it comes to um, filtration because of its negative charge. And also in a number of alternative markets, it's at that actual chemical uh, phase of silicon dioxide in um, a, the super cooled fluid form, why it doesn't cause silicosis because when we get those little particles in our lungs, our body's actually able to, you know, absorb it, get rid of it, it with something like a, a fluid, so it doesn't um, cause scar tissue like crystalline silica does. And sure. that, um, so I was just going to say, certainly a dust hazard, but not a silicosis breathing hazard. So. No, it's by, uh, it's just considered a, a nuisance dust. Right. So, it, you know, people in the construction company are doing all kinds of things to mitigate dust because the dust that comes up from the, the dirt that they're riding on or co coming through concrete and the sand that's in the concrete is actually making the crystal silica dust. So they're always happy to find out that if they're actually um, using glass in a fine form or creating dust by pulverizing glass, it's not hazardous. It's actually safer than the dirt coming off your driveway. Sure. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's maybe go through some secondary or alternate uses and see what we can learn from you about those alternate uses. And of course, I assume that the equipment that you provide is capable of producing a feedstock, um, you know, um, you man a manufactured feedstock for these different applications. And, you know, we could start with your companion company. I know you make an aggregate or a pulverized product for Ruby Lake glass. Maybe you could That's tell right. us a little about that. Yeah, so I'd love to do that. Um, part of the reason, part of the evolution of my company, uh, always making equipment has been talking to people about what to do with the glass once they do that. And that's brought me into many different countries. And when I was in a different country uh, visiting customers who were pulverizing glass, they said, hey, take a look at this. And there was a technology which we licensed with a proprietary process for coating the glass and putting a very durable chemically bonded coating on glass. And then you can make it any color. So Ruby Lake Glass is a company that makes a specialty aggregate. We take sand, very fine sand, 
it can be smaller than a millimeter in size and we can color code it. So it is like a very fine um, coated sand that can go as an additive in um, um, any kind of wall coatings or sealants to make a color texture and durability. And if you make bigger particles colors, then you can put it on the road for bike lanes and bus lanes. It can go into concrete blocks, which can be polished. It looks like terrazzo and you can get aggregate in it that's red or purple or blue without having to have it blue through it like a mirror. You look through the glass, you see the, the coating on the other side. So that's um, my newest venture, that company. So that's, that's an actual glass recycling company. And our feedstock for glass is, is not in competing with the bottle glass at all. We're taking in clear glass that's not being recycled somewhere else. It might be panel glass from the uh, electronics recycling industry, uh, plate glass, um, all different types of uh, clear glass. So it's a niche market that's built on recycling other types of glass. Understood. Uh, okay. So what about like, I know in Pennsylvania, one of our uses, which I happen to think is a really great use is as a water dispersing media or filtration media in on lot mounted septic systems. Um, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? And, um, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, personally, um, you know, at my home, uh, for the last, uh, I guess, about eight years now, I have a mounted uh, septic system. I'm not on public sewer. And my mound is, in fact, filled with uh, about 150 tons of recycled, you know, pulverized glass uh, of the PennDOT specification that it needs to be made to. So, um, you know, personally, at least for that period of time, I haven't had any trouble in the, in the least. Uh, so... Um, and of course, now that I've said it, not expecting it either, but, um, but could you elaborate on that a little? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, that's one of the best applications that I can think of because when you uh, pulverize glass into a sand, um, when it comes right out of the system, you don't have to do one of, one of our systems. Um, you just, it comes out in the red gradation. You need glass sand that has not too many fines, not too many cores, a good uh, gradation. So it comes right out in the gradation you need. You don't have to do a lot of post-processing. Um, glass, because of its nature, is very hard and angular, okay? So that means when you use it, you don't have any water flowing through it. Like if you think about glass, um, it's like a crystal, you know, like a diamond. And the water goes around the particles. It doesn't go through the particles. If you think about sand, sand can be more like a sponge, okay? So, and sand is just whatever aggregate you have wherever you are. Okay, so if you have a lot of limestone in your area, like we do up here, and there's many places in, in Pennsylvania the same, the water will go through the particles until it leaches out the lime, and then the particles will collapse. So you might start out with sand particles that are a certain size, but over time they can collapse because of their um, um, uh, water running through them. This is what they call, then you get what you call channeling and, and clogging in an infiltration application, that's a real problem. Um, but glass won't do that. So whatever particle size you put in there will be that size you know, a million years from now. So you have a very durable, angular is important because angular allows for a lot of um, fluid flow through the part of particles so that it doesn't clog up too quickly. And also the surface chemistry again of the glass being negatively charged, it likes to attract water. So glass particles hold a, a layer of water on them on a, on a regular basis. They're always coated. And that means everything's, quote, pre-wetted. And again, that means that when you have a filtration, it will go through there quickly because it's pre-wetted um, and it'll uh, provide the filtration you want. So it's an excellent application for it because you need a good a filtration sand with good filtration, but also good durability so it doesn't break down over time. And that translates to other filtration applications like swimming pool filter sand or just plain, um, you know, under a slab as a construction sand. Um, up here, we have frost heaving, um, and it's a problem under sidewalks or slabs or, you know, even pipe bedding for um, some sort of piping. You just don't want the, to have trapped water that ends up freezing and then expanding and then, you know, causing. Um, something to be moved with its piping or, or your slab. 
So again, if you put a whole bed of, of glass sand underneath your, your concrete slab or under your deck or wherever, it will filter the water away. It won't sit there and be trapped and it won't freeze and cause heating. Understood. Good, good one to point out, certainly for both New York, uh, where you're located in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the things you did touch on, though, that I heard was that you referenced that one of your models or machines will produce the pulverization that's needed to meet the specification for use of the glass in an on-lot septic system. So the, what I picked up on there is to meet the demands of this market, there's an obvious specification that needs to be met. As I recall, that's an ASTM derived specification that's been adopted uh, by PennDOT. Um, and to your knowledge, hopefully that's correct. Um, but my, my point is to meet this market or any other market, it's not just a matter of you know, going out back, so to speak, and hitting this glass apart with a sledgehammer. There's a known specification that in many cases, the material or the glass needs to conform with. And that's just, of course, one example. Yeah, that's really important, though, because um, in the past, when glass wasn't, uh, say, it was mixed and dirty and wasn't uh, suitable for a bottle to bottle market, um, the recyclers just thought, well, I'll just screen it. I'll just, you know, put it through a half inch screen or three quarter inch screen or whatever. And um, then I'll try to market it to the aggregate market. In the aggregate market, the DOTs are like, no, there's a bunch of ASTM standards of gradation and size, sieve analysis, uh, compaction. You, it has to meet those. You have to do some processing to meet it. And that's where our equipment comes in because we take, um, you know, any size of glass all mixed with other debris, but bring it down to a specification. So you can, it will come right out of the system as a, um, a four mesh minus Omita C33 um, sand specification. You know, you can do a little bit of tweaking on what screen size you put in there, but because it comes out in a variety of sizes, including fines as well, it's up to course. And there's no sharp edges either. That's an important thing because many people were concerned that it was um, sharp edges. And by people, I mean DOTs, you know, people who could use this. They said, well, it doesn't have sharp edges. Does it have debris in it besides glass? You know, they're used to going to the gravel pit and picking something up that meets a, a, a particular um, specification and they want the glass supply, that pile of glass to meet those same specifications. So understanding what those are and meeting those specifications are really important. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, something you brought out just now is that you know, not only can this material, once it's pulverized, be sharp free, which you know, I don't think a lot of people associate with the word glass, right? Um, you also, by virtue of how it's pulverized by the, the, the fractioning uh, science, if you will, of the glass, come out with different sizes. So it needs to be screened, which implies to me, you need multiple market outlets whether it's color mixed or possibly not color mixed, because you're going to end up by the very nature of how glass fractures with multiple size ranges, right? Yeah, that out of coming out of the system that we usually produce like two size ranges. We do a, a sand size and what we call a gravel size. And the gravel size is kind of, um, it's desirable for the uh, uh, again, filtration, you know, pipe bedding and that type of filtration. Mm -hmm. But also um, people like it for landscaping because it's a colored stone. It doesn't have sharp edges, but it's sparkly. Um, so it's great as a, a landscaping aggregate in that form. If a customer wants all glass sand though, you can simply just add a conveyor to the system and recirculate you know, the gravel size and just make all sand. And then the last byproduct is just all the trash. You know, So um, our equipment tends to be more like a tornado. It's not like gravel pit equipment where you're crushing everything and reducing it in size um, together. It's more of a selective reduction. So if you put in a bottle, the caps, the labels and stuff come out big and they get screened out and separated um, based on their size. And things that get in there, like if you get a plastic bottle that gets in there, you know, it looks like a clear bottle, but it's actually a plastic bottle, it's a water bottle. It's, um, you know, in single stream, you got everything from chicken bones to, uh, you know, um, uh, golf balls to everything in between hardware 
those things will just go through without hurting anything and then be screened out. So you can selectively reduce the glass, but leave the trash larger. And it's it's a very simple concept. It's just, um, you know, always, and it's always been that way, coming up with a design that's specific to reducing glass, but not reducing or grinding up the rest of the trash. Well, moving on, uh, you mentioned um, some other markets. One that you touched on was for glass as a as a media, you know, in a filter housing, uh, mm -hmm. almost like a bucket or container to filter spa and pool water. Um, I know we have a facility in Pennsylvania that manufactures that, has been approved to make that. Um, have you been using any of your glass for that as well? Yeah, we have people that, um, you know, buy it for sandblasting and then water filtration. I think we sold out quite a large number of tons of it to a, uh, a camp up in northern New York. I, I can't think of the name of it right now, but they used it when they re-engineered their um, septic system and they needed, you know, a filter sand before they discharge the water. So it can be a, a small system that's with a pool or it can be engineered into the, you know, water treatment for a larger um, development or camp. We have to continue to educate the engineers who put those systems together so they can understand that they can, they want to know that it needs a certain size specification and can be a replacement for a natural aggregate. But once they get the material to test, they're happy with that. And that's similar to sandblasting. Both sandblasting and um, um, filtration are, you know, um, different types of applications that you have to have very specific sizes for. So they do take a little more processing and might be, a, you know, a type of glass that is a little bit cleaner or you have to get bottle glass and clean it up a, a bit more than, you know, directly out of the machine. Well, here in Pennsylvania, also talking about these different uses is just simply a use approved for structural aggregate for PennDOT related aggregate when we need to secure, you know, a stormwater pipe and anchor it from road vibration or, you know, a pipe or, for instance, maybe the head of a gas well. Um, have you seen any of those types of uses in New York? Yeah, yeah, we have. And New York's done a good job recently on um, clarifying a lot of things um, to transition the glass from the recycling realm into the construction realm so that these projects can use it. Um, they used to have a lot of beneficial use designations, which meant every single use for glass aggregate had to go through this, you know, individual beneficial use. They've now clarified that or, or simplified it by simply coming up with a specification on sizing and, and cleanliness. And they said, okay, if the glass is pulverized to these size, this size, and this cleanliness, then it is no longer a, a regulated product. It's now you know, cross that line into a commodity. So once you've done that, then the, uh, it can be stockpiled and um, treated just like any other pile of sand or gravel. And that's really important because the construction projects need quite a bit of it. They might need a thousand tons, they might need 5,000 tons for a project. And that could be a glass fault project. It could be, you know, a construction piping, um, pipe bedding. So we need to kind of, you know, get, get it across the line and then have it stockpiled somewhere where it can be specced in and processed. We had um, a project in uh, 145 several years ago where the DOT you know, put in a large um, um, drainage area next to the road. you know, And because we had um, material ready to go, then they could come and test our pile, make sure it had the characteristics they needed. And then they brought in the dump trucks and you know, I don't know, it was a few thousand tons disappeared in a few days. And they all went down the road and ended up, you know, in, under the piping. And, you know, I think important to point out whether it's, for instance, blasting abrasives that we've talked about, on lot septic use, filtration, now structural fill, not color dependent, is it? No, not at all. And that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because people ask, well, what kind of glass? It, any glass that's not a um, hazardous type glass, okay? So we don't want, you know, leaded CRT glass or any lead. We don't want fluorescent tubes. But any other type of glass and any other type of ceramics even, because ceramics is also amorphous silica. It's just an opaque amorphous silica instead of a clear 
in Morpheus Ota. So we've had um, the goodwill come and, and you know leave us material to pulverize, and we just mix it in with the glass, and it makes a you know a white sand, and um, all those other types can be can be included because it's not color specific. Now there are some regulations in some of the other uh, in New York or some of the other places that say you know don't put ceramics in or don't put this in because they are trying to make sure they don't have foreign materials in that you know, they don't know what it is. So you have to be aware of that, but it, it is all amorphous silica. Good, well, I, I had heard at one time too, at least at a, a venue on the West Coast that makes water filtration media. One of their interests is that they only use clear glass because then when you open the filter housing after having used it for a while, if there's some sort of debris that's been filtered, it's very easy to see intermixed with the, you know, the white or slightly off-white background, if you will, you know, versus mm -hmm. something that would be green or amber. So, mm -hmm. you know, often these applications don't have, you know, a color preference, but sometimes there might be a preference for marketing reasons. So yeah, there is. You know, we just had somebody come in from the local golf course and, you know, took, I don't know, maybe 10 tons of material, but he wanted all the white, the white pine. And because we use clear glass in Ruby Lake, we had some um, clear, you know, fine glass. And that was what he wanted because he wanted white, white bunkers. You know, you want the, the white sand. So that for him, it was a great deal because if you're going to try to find white, white sand, you have to ship it a long distance and pay a lot of money. Well, you know, a lot of people, I think, present day, we've heard over the last year to year and a half that, you know, especially with the downturn in municipal finances with the impacts of our pandemic, you know, we've heard a lot of people talk about, should I get rid of glass? Should I quit recycling glass? Does it make financial sense to quit recycling glass? And certainly, you know, I guess everyone's situation can be said to be unique, but at the same time, you know, it seems with a lot of these alternate uses that can be very local, um, you know, as if we really may not need to do that. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, Cindy? Yeah, I know you can, you can get me going on that, I guess, because <laughs> the thing that really bothers me about the let's not recycle glass because it's not economic is because if you talk about who's the competition to glass recycling, okay, it's not the competition between bottle to bottle recycling versus glass to sand recycling. The competition is the waste and recycling companies who own the landfills, okay? Because they just want the glass to go in the landfill. It's heavy, it doesn't take up much space, they get paid when it goes across the scale. And so um, there's no incentive for them to try to do something else, um, except the fact that it's the right thing to do and their customers may be saying they want it. Um, but their alternative is you know, in-house and so on. So we really have to look at this as an alternative to the landfill. And that's, you know, what we need to do. So if you look at it as alternative to the landfill, you can capture any type of glass, you know, whether it's a single stream glass, um, that's all can be cleaned up. There are systems out there and we provide systems. It's just that you have to get the debris out of the, the shredded paper out of that glass that's in single stream. And then, you have to look and do an analysis of what your markets are. If you got people who would like that clear glass, you know, it can be, you can, you can screen it and you can send the bigger glass off to be optically sorted. And then the finer glass can be pulverized. If you're too far away from those markets, you can pulverize it all locally and just use it locally. You know, there's the, there's lots of local uses, um, whether it's, you know, filling the potholes in the uh, parking lot at the uh, recycling center or, you know, selling it for um, sand, you know, to the community. Um, we have a, we help our own community um, because of this issue with, with the pandemic and with the um, China sword, the single stream in our community was going um, shipped away, away, and they originally were getting paid, you know, for the single stream to go there, but with the change in the environment that is now costing them. So they went from being paid $15 to being charged $75. So they had a hundred dollars swing or almost a hundred dollars swing. And they said, wow, this is municipality wise, this is blowing our budget. But if we could get the glass to you, you know, 
at our manufacturing facility, we operate a pulverizer too. I won't charge them, I'll charge them very little or take it for, for nothing. So they right away said, oh, okay, let's start diverting the glass, you know, and get it, get it over to you. Um, so sometimes it's a combination of things. In their case, they put out some um, bottle drop-off centers that they'll bring to us, but we're also working with the municipality to see if we can provide a solution for the single stream glass. But the single stream glass is at this point still going as landfill cover because they own the landfill and it's just so easy to get there. So I think there's all kinds of opportunities. There's a lot of glass that's not recovered. Um, if you look at the EPA um, numbers on um, just glass in the waste stream, the America um, throws away about nine to 11 million tons of glass every year, a total type of glass. And we only recycle, you know, a couple million tons a year through our traditional. So there's all kinds of, you know, types of glass that's still going in the landfill that could be diverted. But it's an education process and it's a, it's a bigger view. And it, I think an acceptance of turning glass into sand that that's legitimate recycling. I think in the recycling world, there's still a lot of people who say, well, if it's going back to sand, it's not really recycling. But sand is a resource that is also becoming short supply. There's only, you know, someone in the aggregate industry told me that in New York, there was, you know, um, about half as many quarries as there once was, and they can't get cited either. So the cost of sand and the availability of sand is going up. So um, why blow up a hill when you can recycle the glass, which is um, sustainable and circular because every year we throw away that much glass. Every year we can recycle it. It's a hill that never goes away. So let's mine the glass out of the urban waste stream and recycle it into something. And you're not gonna have, be mining a resource that eventually will go away. Oh, that's very true, Cindy. I mean, uh, you know, like you said, something present and something available. Um, you know, at the end of the day, those minerals are non-renewable, right? And, and, yeah. the, and the hope would be that we could in various forms perpetuate the use uh, even if it's downcycled, much like you pointed out, perpetuate the use of the glass. Um, you know, and on that note, you know, two of the two of the questions um, coming in from our attendees, you know, one was asking the question, you know, can you include porcelain or just ceramics in the mix? You know, and I think you can comment on that, but I also think that's, you know, of course, uh, dependent on what market you're preparing it for. Um, and then we equally have a question from uh, uh, Representative State Rep Lee James, who's been really forward thinking and taking a look at what we possibly might be able to do in Pennsylvania with solar panel recycling legislation, asked if you may be able to comment on the recyclability of solar panel glass. So again, some questions on porcelain and ceramics, but also solar panel glass, if you could could address that for us. Sure. Yeah, on the porcelain ceramic, you certainly can uh, pulverize it. It all depends on the market. So if you're going to somebody who's going to use it for landscaping and you know a sand and aggregate, um, it makes beautiful material for that. But if it was somebody who's going to bottle to bottle recycling, they wouldn't want it because it doesn't have the same melting point and same chemistry as bottled glass. So it's all. Um, technically po possible, but you have to know what the market is to find, you know, the connection. Um, on solar uh, recycling, we do have equipment for um, processing solar glass, you know, because we have equipment that recycles windshields and laminated glass and solar panels are laminated on glass. And so they would go through some of our equipment uh, similar to other types of laminated glass. And what you end up doing is you end up uh, beating the glass off it, you know, we, we mechanically, physically strip the glass off the laminate back, backing on it. Solar panels are tough yet, though, because there is no standardization in their manufacturing. So when you get solar panels, they haven't, just like EV vehicles and batteries, you know, they haven't standardized yet on what is the best technology. So some of them, you can re remove the glass and have a nice clean a laminate background, you know, for easy separation and recycling. Other ones are more complicated. They don't, you know, recycle quite as well. But in any case, we can remove anywhere from, you know, 40 to 80% of the weight, which is glass. 
and then you can recycle then we can recycle the glass back into um sand and sand related materials so if we can clean it up enough we'll, we'll recycle that right back into a like glass and color code it and go out and market for that so um that's going to be a big you know that's going to be a challenge in the future and we're working on that with different companies so just to kind of um i guess pun intended encapsulate your remarks on solar panel glass the glass itself to what you've seen so far is in fact usable but the panels depending on where they were manufactured are not all manufactured to the same style or standard such that the protective coating on the glass much like you have a protective coating on windshield glass that protective coating can vary brand to brand and presents perhaps difficulties or ease of release of the glass or not. Um, and you need to make adjustments and considerations for that. But if you can economically release the glass from the from its protective coating, anti breakage coating, the glass itself is a soda lime glass that's usable. That is correct. Yep. So the glass is all usable. We can use it. It's just um, getting it off the laminate. And uh, in windshields, you've got a, a PVB, polyvinylbutylene laminate, and uh, that lets the glass go a little bit easier than EVA, which is a laminate that's in a lot of solar panels. In either case, we can remove the glass. It's just, you know, whether you can get 80% or 90% effectiveness, or if you're down to more like 50 or 60% because of its you know, how it's constructed. And then of course, there are other non-glass components, wiring or the photovoltaic that, um, you know, that can be reclaimed differently, I assume. That's right. And that's what they look at is, okay, let's see once how much of the glass we can get off from it first, because that reduces the weight um, and you produce material you can recycle. And then what's left over ends up um, being um, maybe uh, size reduced and shredded and you know, um, kind of part it out a bit more to see if they can recover some uh, precious metals that might possibly be in there. Um, the backing itself, the EVA, and some of the other backings. Um, they're not, a the backing on them are not standard. There's, you know, everything from a carbon fiber backing, which is a real mess, to um, some nice white sheets that come, the glass comes off quite easily. Um, so it will depend a bit on that. But you know, the, what we offer is the first step, which is, okay, let's remove as much of the glass as possible. And then that gives you, um, you know, the leftovers to work with. Understood. Well, thank you for that level of detail very much. Um, you know, coming back to some of our secondary markets, structural fill, yeah. blasting abrasives, um, filtration media, on lot septic, water dispersion media, um trying to make sure we go through a lot of these uses you know one use i had heard about over time and haven't heard a lot about recently is the use of reclaimed soda lime glass as a fluxing agent in manufacturing bricks have you ever heard of this type of use uh have you heard about it being popularized anywhere um yes i have and um, um been at brick manufacturing plants you know that were incorporating it um, it hasn't been uh, popularized a lot because um, brick manufacturing hasn't um, really, um, you know, gone, brick manufacturing and actually tile manufacturing is two different types. It's a heated up process and the glass, number one, has to be quite fine in size. So it's a, it's a fine material. Um, and then it needs to be batched with the clay and the other types of things. But it makes some really nice self-glazing brick and tile. So people have done a lot of experimenting with it and like some of the, uh, what, it, what it turns out to be, but they do need a large, they want a large amount of glass flux and they don't wanna to pay too much for it because they're um, looking at it as a um, competing with clay or something else, okay? So it's definitely a, a technically a very nice market, but the pricing hasn't all been in line with each other yet. Um, but again, it's, if you have a brick manufacturer nearby then the waste and recycling people in that that area would probably be able to make it work as long as you've got some fairly good quantity and you don't have to spend a lot of money shipping it somewhere because you don't have any extra margin for shipping you know once you start shipping glass it's heavy 
you ship it any distance at all, it's already costing you 50 bucks a ton or 100 bucks a ton to ship it. So you have to find local markets. Um, and there's limited local markets for, for the brick. Um, one thing, Bob, that I'm wondering if we can mention is the um, using it as an additive soil amendment, okay, for with our composting and so on. Um, sure, yeah, I hadn't brought that up yet, but please do. It's a project that, you know, we're certainly involved with as well as in Dallas. So go ahead and elaborate on that. Yeah, I think I'm really excited about this because one of the things that is a waste product that's being um, segregated from the waste stream now more and more is compost, uh, food waste and green waste and so on. And composting is now the like the third wave of recycling, which is important. Uh, you know, if you look at what's in the garbage, a lot of it's wet waste. So you make compost and then it's also um, an issue where you've got food waste. Quite often people come to me and say, oh no, there's a, there's a piece of glass in my compost um, because, you know, a piece of glass broke in the process of being composted from food waste. And I say, well, you can't pick that little piece of glass out, but why don't we just add glass sand to the whole mix and we'll call it an additive, get rid of that vermiculite, put glass sand in. So I've been talking about that for a while and I was excited because the um, working with Pennsylvania here, they've got a project going with uh, a landscape architect and um, a university with funding from the federal government to test um, a third party testing on um, substituting sand and putting glass sand in instead of sand um, with compost and with some other type of dirt and making um, basically a recycled soil amendment. And uh, those results are just starting to come out. There's some very promising results and glass as a substitute for sand in that application. It brings um, available silica to the, to the mix uh, filtration. Um, so I can kind of go through those things, but you need a third party to, that really knows what they're doing to test it out and figure out what the right mix is. So once that comes out and people have some guidance on that, um, that's another great local option because you're con you can kind of see where you'd have a pile of glass sand sitting there and then a pile of compost next to it. And if you can take those two things and mix them, then if people see a little sparkle in there, it doesn't, it isn't like a surprise. It's actually an engineered mix. And then I always said that we all we all bought into little white pieces of looks like styrofoam, they're vermiculite, but you know, something foreign in our black dirt as a good thing. It provides, you know, lightweight and filtration. Well, glass will do similar. And uh, that's a new emerging market that I can see really taking off because it's so local and it solves the local problem of two different materials. Which is an interesting point you bring up. We have a business that's emerged over the last few years in Southeast Pennsylvania, aero aggregates that takes color mixed glass and aerates it essentially uh, to produce an ultra lightweight aggregate, you know, something very similar, at least in physical, you know, physical weight and appearance to a lava rock um, yeah. used yeah. in many, many highly engineered applications where a lightweight, structurally supportive, you know, fill materials needed, especially in areas of high water tables and perched water tables. So, um, you know, they're on course to use the equivalent of 240, um, 240 million, I believe, uh, you know, beer bottles, if you will, in a year's time. Um, just a tremendous volume of color mixed glass. And, you know, um, you know, just another example of where, you know, markets are, are perhaps more local, but not absent, um, you know. Yeah. That's an excellent application because I'm, of course, familiar with that company and, you know, pulverizing the glass through my equipment makes it the specification that they want to go into their plant. And you have to get it cleaner. And, you know, the single stream glass has got a lot of little bits of plastic in it too. So, um, you know, we design systems that will do the selective size reduction, but also density separation and clean up, you know, so it, it's kind of our solutions are evolving from just crushing or pulverizing glass to glass cleanup systems so that it can be clean enough to go into their um, operation because they actually grind it down even finer and, you know, they do a bunch of wonderful things to it to make it turn into this um, ultra lightweight foamy glass. It's, it's really another great market and it's very common in Europe it's starting to come come here I'm excited about that because that's gonna again provide alternatives 
it doesn't matter what color. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting. There was a there's a read available from the Environmental Protection Agency from the early 1970s. I want to say 1972, although I could be wrong, where ultra lightweight glass manufactured aggregate was a recommended market for color mixed glass even then and literally sat tabled until someone here domestically began to really evolve it. Um, so so uh, coming backward though, you know, you mentioned single stream glass. There are, you know, are options as you've just pointed out for cleaning that glass up as, you, as you've uh, alluded to. I know one of the things you pointed out earlier was the mix of fiber uh, or, you know, shriveled labeling and paper residue with glass. You know, when I talk to glass people, they say we don't want the fiber. When I talk to, you know, those in the paper manufacturing industry, they say we don't want the solids, we don't want the glass. So, you know, it's this, you know, this chocolate peanut butter kind of thing that, you know, uh, some have it and some don't and others don't want it. So, um, you know, I, I've heard upwards of, you know, in some applications, that initial cleaning and, and debris, if you will, the glass can be as much as anywhere from 30 to 60% of, you know, what you're removing. Um, you found that to be true in some cases? Yeah, there's, it, yeah, in some cases, um, with the advent of home shredding, um, it wasn't that bad before. But what's changed over the last uh, five years is home shredding. So when home shredding became um, popular and, and standard for security reasons, that shredded paper just goes down through, when it goes into the MRF, it just floats down through the screens, which are all based on size. So the glass ends up going through the, you know, one inch minus screens, and so does all that shredded paper. Mm. And so by weight, it might be 20% of the mix, but by visual volume it's much more you know you, you look at a pile and you're like where's the glass all you see is the shredded paper um the good news is is that shredded paper is so much lighter than glasses so um we offer a glass, you know kind of just a real simple blower system for glass cleanup um other companies offer glass cleanup that can go into the material recovery facility and if they happen to be going through um one of our systems to make gravel sand that they don't have to remove everything it's just getting that shred out okay um so you can blow it you know it's as simple as blowing it at the right point blowing the fines just put a wind across it and get it get it to go one direction the heavy the other direction so it is kind of a custom design system depending on you know the work itself but um it can be it can be fixed but it visually it kind of scares people off when they first look at it because you can't see anything but the shredded glass. But by weight, it's probably 20% by weight. But it looks like it's the other way around. It looks like 80% paper and 20% glass by volume. Hmm. So, you know, I, I did touch on a number of alternate applications. One that I didn't touch on um, was I've often seen and heard where smaller um grades or smaller gradations of glass you know almost powder like can be used for like a hardening agent or a wear surface improver to extend the wear let's say the back i've heard you know like carpet backing for instance have you seen or heard of some of these uses as well yeah there's we've in our ruby lake application in our ruby lake glass where we recycle glass we have um, dust collector fines, you know, because it is a dry process. So we have a dust collector and that fine glass is really fine. It's the size of cement. Okay. And we also have a gradation that's less than 70 minus, which is not quite cement size, but goes between that cement size up to a very, very fine sand. Those end up being uh, mineral fillers. And one is like you say, but carpet backing. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of carpet manufacturers in the Northeast. So if you have to ship it a long way, it's, it's hard to find, you know, a place for it to go. Um, but there's other um, applications where people want to, you know, use it as a mineral filler. One, this is a very niche one, but I have a friend who um, is into boats and um, we have epoxy that we also work with Ruby Lake Glass for putting the glass down. And he took some of the epoxy and the really fine stuff and he said that made the strongest, hardest, 
you know, um, material to fix my boat with. So let's go market it to all the boating people, you know, and that's as a mineral filler, just an epoxy and putting it in as mineral filler. So there, there's probably a lot of applications that haven't really been explored yet. Um, and it will take the place of a, a calcium carbonate mineral filler. And, uh, you know, there's quite a few applications out there for that yet too. It's even gone, um, we've sold a number of it to a company that makes horse rink sand. They'll take the fines and they put their own special um, secret sauce with it. So it's not dusty and it's just right for, for horse rinks because the horses, you know, um, don't like dust no more than people do and, and they can run on it. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities. It's very interesting to see what people um, come up with on their own if you just give them samples to work with. Well, I know I've seen already where some of those mineral fines um, and, you know, even ceramically derived fines can be used in epoxies of all things that are used to repair, believe it or not, uh, cemetery tombstones. Because over, oh, yeah. time, over time you have, you know, significant cracking and separation of the stone, certainly from its base as well. And like you pointed out earlier with the water intrusion and the freeze thaw, it just continues to deteriorate, you know, historic element like that. So, you know, I've seen some of those, those types of epoxies used in applications like that already. Um, um, so, you know, certainly, you know, a, a legitimate use for those, you know, very fine gradations of material where, you know, there's a, an economically competitive market opportunity. Um, yeah, we're, we're introducing that with Ruby Lake glass um, because we can color coat glass that's like half a millimeter in size. Because of our process, we can, you know, take that very fine glass, apply a colored coating to it, and it doesn't stick together, it's free flowing. Then you can add it to a clear um, concrete. So um, like even that wall behind us in our, our background, you know, a gray wall went like that. You can take um, dry lock, which is a concrete sealer, and you just stir this in and then you trawl it on or you spray it on and it's a stucco finish and you've got the, the concrete sealant, but you've got color and texture. So we're getting into the additives market, which will bring in glass uncoated as well as glass coated into the um, uh, coatings and aggregate market, but it's not even aggregate, it's more like an additive. You've, you kind of see them now when you go there and you buy something to seal your con your floor in the garage and they put these little flex of stuff in. Well, it could be colored glass and then you'd have some, not only some color, but you'd have friction, which may be an advantage so you don't slip and fall on your, your ramps and your stairs. So that's, uh, you know, stay tuned. You're going to see more of that show up in your hardware store too. And it might come from Ruby Lake glass. This bit's got, if it looks like colored sand, it'll be recycled back. <clears throat> well, we, we wouldn't have a complete discussion today if we didn't address, you know, the fact that the glass industry itself, the bottle to bottle industry is on a heightened alert to look for, you know, more glass, more color, more recycling of that color. Uh, you know, I've sat through many discussions where, you know, a key thing that's been pointed out is, well, if you pay us more for it, maybe it yeah. incentivize people to bring it or bring it a longer distance, perhaps. Um, you know, I can only think that with the cost of uh, petroleum and natural gas uh, going vertical, that this just becomes more and more important. I don't know what you're hearing on the street in that regard, but I would tend to think that we're at an all-time interest point for color glass as well. Yeah, no, you're right. I hear the same thing. It's like, well, why don't they pay you more? You know, you might get paid twenty dollars a ton, and you have to drive it all the way over there, and you got to get it all colored separated. You know, um, they would get more if they pay more. I, on their side, they keep saying, "Well, it's, we just will pay whatever the cost of raw materials are." In other words, if sand and soda ash doesn't charge us that much then we're just gonna use that instead of paying for cullet, you know? But on the other hand, they need cullet and it will save them on their, their um, energy usage because it melts at a lower temperature. Um, all I can say is like, you know, uh, I'm all for it. You know, the more glass that we get recycled, you know, we have some of our customers have pressures and screeners and make furnace ready cullet too. So 
you know, my customers are customers who might turn glass into sand, but there's also the customers that are trying to harvest more glass and they would like to go to the bottle manufacturers if they can. And they should, you know, it's, it's uh, the boat rises for everybody. The more we can convince people to get glass out of the waste stream, the more glass that's gonna be available for, for either market. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because actually if you have both markets, um, an example of that is Fairfax, Virginia. They have a big, big blue machine, which is one of our big pulverizers. And to feed the big blue machine, they started with a lot of drop-off centers and they were getting very clean glass coming in, okay? And uh, so they did have people that are bottled the bottle recyclers say, we'd like that. And they said, okay, fine. If you'll pay us enough money, we won't pulverize it, you can have it, okay? And if you don't pay us enough money, then we'll pulverize it because we have contractors who want it. And so that helped them, the recycler, when you talk about economic incentives for the recyclers, is if they have alternatives in their markets, then they have leverage and they could get better, they could get better pricing. Well, you know, that's interesting talking about the word leverage. You know, I've seen personally, it seems as if there's a shift in the container business where a number of the downstream users of these glass containers by their customers and their client base, you know, I think we've got this reverb now pushing back on uh, what consumers desire and the social choice patterns of, you know, what these companies are going to demand as far as, you know, recycle content and circularity within the container. Um, yeah. I, I think you'd agree. It seems as if that message is starting to really pick up and, and start, you know, the flow of resonance. Um, and of course, then we get this real or perceived fear of extended producer responsibility, you know, the big EPR. Uh, any any okay. thoughts on that, Cindy? Yeah, I really like the EPR. I ran into that when I was working over in England. They have a uh, a well-developed EPR system. And if it's properly done, it, it is actually less hassle than the uh, bottle return system that we have in New York. Um, because with the bottle return system, every I mean, every distributor has to, you know, go through and, and get somebody to recycle their glass. And there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of data collection and, and distribution of the funds between everybody and so on. And then whatever bottles don't get redeemed, the, the state takes it and it doesn't really get back to the people. And so, um, in fact, a little story, when I was the very first money I ever made in my life, I grew up in Michigan, was um, recycling glass. I'd get on my bicycle and go down the road and, and pull Coke bottles out of the ditch and wash them up and sure. get my two or three pence. And that's really what would recycle glass is if they can bring their glass in and get some pennies. And um, if we had to produce a responsibility and it was based on weight, not on a per bottle basis, then everybody could collect any kind of glass and they could bring it into a recycling center and get it weighed and get so much per pound. And that funding would really get recycling going for glass because somebody could, you know, pick up any kind of glass and bring it in. And depending on what type of glass, it might go into different containers, but they would get paid per pound. But to fund that, you need to produce a responsibility. You need the people who manufacture the bottles to pay that per pound price into the into the pool so it can go back to the people and then the recycler can right. also get mm -hmm. well you know but part I, of it part of it too cindy that i've seen is that and and you know of course we don't have anyone from owens illinois other you know you and i talking but mm -hmm. there are you know we have these examples of you know 1920s through the you know even 60s and early 70s bottles that were heavily thick walled, reusable, returnable glass bottles compared to the non-returnables that we have today. And many, right. country, many countries of the world, including Canada, if you just study the composition of the container, mm -hmm. have returnable bottles that aren't anywhere near the weight of those, you know, that, that pre-existed here in the US, uh, perhaps, do provide some transportation uh, savings, but yet aren't as um, you know disposable, so to speak, as the thin-walled glass bottles that we presently have. And of course, you know, and of course, the the thinner we get, and the more those bottles fracture in collection or transport, 
you know, in a reverse fashion, the more difficult it is to get it color separated and back into color as a primary use. And then we have to depend on any one of these, you know, secondary uses that we've talked about today. So, you know, um, you know, I think there is argument for, you know, those that use the container demanding and, and taking a look at what should the design of my container really be to help optimize the recovery of the color. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's important. They have a, they have a challenge between um, making it more durable, you know, so it can be recycled um, better uh, against functionality or, you know, demand in the market because they lose out to aluminum because it's lightweight or plastic because it's lightweight. When it comes to like uh, wine bottles or champagne bottles, they win because everybody likes a nice heavy wine or champagne bottle. Plus they don't want it to blow up. If it's naturally carbonated, you don't want your bottle to blow up. So it's nice and thick, you know? But unfortunately, a lot of those are green and we don't have markets for green glass. So you have this disconnect again between, you know, what's out there and, and what can be recycled to different mar markets. It, it's, it's important to be very flexible and really understand multiple markets so you can make it work. Um, one small story is I, I worked with uh, the um, US Virgin Islands in the past and they had a program they were starting where they were gonna put a uh, uh, produce responsibility fee on everything coming in the island mm. container wise. Okay, and because they were an island they could capture all that. And then, um, um, you know, three cents a pound was gonna go to the recycler and another three cents a pound to the people. And that was, that started and that was cleaning up the island quickly. Everybody would go along and clean up the roads and, you know, because they could bring it in. It was all based on weight, very simple weight based, not when it came to glass, it was all weight based. So it could come in broken, whole, whatever. And being an island, they were going to pulverize it and use it as sand. Um, it didn't last though, because they were part of the U.S. Virgin Islands and somebody from a legal point of view decided it was um, too much like a tariff, I guess. Okay. Uh, but it was a great concept that I wish they would bring back to the states and incorporate in some way, because if all our producers of containers, plus everybody who brought containers into the states, just paid on a per pound basis and it went into a fund and that fund was then just equally divided to the people recycling the glass and the people bringing the glass in, that would fund things and it would be so simple. So you don't have to get the distributors involved. And that's why a lot of times the Michigan and New York's had the returnable program for a long time, but it didn't go nationwide because the distributors of the containers really lobbied against it because it added a whole lot of um, work to their distribution. But if, it, if you skipped all the distributors and just had a simple assessment to the manufacturers or the people importing it on a per weight basis, and then you redistributed that money back to the people who actually recycled it, it would be I think very usable, but um, that's that's my that's my simple. I'm not saying it's. I don't know where it's going, but that's just my simple view of it based on my experience on an island. Sure. Well, there certainly are. What is it? Is it seven states that have bottle bills in the U.S.? Um, I may I may be slightly light on that, but you know, certainly not many. And of course, there think there are those that think that's not good. Those that argue that they're you know, very good. Um, what have you seen in that regard? If, if you can comment on that, do you, do you th yeah, think, think it, it's helpful? Yeah, they, 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 they've asked often that about New York. And so in New York, um, the clean glass that goes back to bottle the bottle comes through the bottle return program. And then the single stream glass is what's ending up just not being addressed or, you know, should be turned into sand and other types of, you know, sandblasting and all the other ones because the re bottle return produced the cleanest glass and the easiest flow, you know, most cost-effective flow back in the bottles. So it does provide um, a good flow back in the bottles. And I don't, I think um, over time that's evolved into a program that's workable. Everybody, you know, the distributors, the state, everyone's figured out how to make it work for them, but it's kind of complicated. So a lot of other states, distributors in other states didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. but it works. Well, well, I, I want to kind of, you know, coming up here a little bit past an hour, kind of bring things, I think, if I can, to, to a bit of summation. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody else has any other questions, 
you know, please, please, uh, you know, get those input for us. But, you know, we've talked a little bit about what is competition and what isn't, you know, how to, you know, keep these materials in circular use rather than being disposed. You know, any one of a number of both local and secondary uses for glass, whether it's wear hardeners, on lot filtration, structural fill applications, ultra lightweight aggregate, um, you know, expendable blasting materials, water filtration, you know, even now some experimentation we've been doing with, with you on uh, water filtration, or I should say what use in uh, blended with compost uh, applications and with, you know, another private concern. Um, you know, we've talked about, you know, Ruby Lake applications with painted glass and, and how that can be used quite decoratively and, and protectively for anti-skid app applications. Um, you know, a little bit on basic glass chemistry and financial modeling, you know, the, the similarities in SiO2 to your analogy of water and the three phases that it has. So, you know, I think we've touched a lot of areas today um, you know, and equally that of, you know, producer responsibility and social choice interests. Um, so I, I may ask, um, you know, if we, if, if there's one thing that we can walk away with from you, with our audience, as it relates to glass, wh where would you like to leave us today? Mm, that's a hard one, isn't it? I guess just to really uh, keep a very open mind about all the different markets. Okay. Um, remembering that, you know, it's the limitation is only our own minds and what we think glass can turn into as far as marketing. And um, when you think of all the different markets, then use that in your analysis to find out what's the most cost effective and best way to get the glass out of the landfill. And that's our common goal. Let's get it out of the landfill. It, it certainly is, it is a goal to keep it from disposal where we have economically viable opportunities for that, whether it's a, you know, as colored or a secondary use. So, yep. so with that, Cindy, I'm going to say thank you. I'm certainly going to say thank you to all of our attendees today. Uh, yes. Much, much knowledge shared and, and introduced. Um, I'm again, Bob Bailon with the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. You can find us at penrmc.org. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, you know, feel free to introduce an email or a phone call in that regard. And again, thank you for taking time of your busy August, uh, taking maybe some time away to get your mind off of the world around us, along with depending on where you're at, you know, the humidity and heat of the day as well. So. Cindy, we thank you for all of your knowledge and your comments. Again, we thank our attendees and everybody. Uh, carry on today and have a good day. All right. Thank you.